Welcome to the third class on tactics, Shoreline's first offering in apologetics. Hopefully you've been with us the first two classes as we begin the third. Uh, I love what we're learning. I love what I'm learning as I uh, kind of guide us through this. And I hope you're already putting some of the things we've learned into practice. So let's start by reviewing the tactics that we've learned so far. Remember the two most important questions? The two most important questions. First is, what do you believe? And next is, why do you believe it? And those questions can be reframed. I mean, you can do them in different ways. For example, you could ask, what do you mean by that? And how did you come to that conclusion? So we've learned the first two questions, the most important questions, as you explore and investigate and draw someone out. We also learn what to do when we're stumped. We kind of hit a wall. We don't know where to go. Something's occurred in a conversation. We just don't know which way to go. So here's the answer. Here's what you do. Nothing. You try to learn from there. So you ask yourself this kind of a question. Did they do an assertion or an argument? Is that what they expressed? Which one? And if it's an assertion or even an argument, you can say, that's an interesting point of view. What's your argument? Now, when we talk about argument and assertion, you might remember we've covered the house without walls. Remember that? The roof is like the assertion. It's just sitting on the ground. In order for the roof to be part of the house and to function as a roof, it needs walls. The walls are the argument, the data, the facts, the information, the evidence that build the walls that then support the opinion. Without the walls, it's simply an opinion, a claim, and you're not required to take it seriously. You treat it with respect. But you can then allow yourself not to be drawn into an argument that isn't an argument. Like someone says, all people over six foot tall grew up drinking goat's milk. That's not an argument. <laughs> That's an assertion. You don't have to get drawn into a, a back and forth on that. We learn what to do when we get on the hot seat, how to get out of the hot seat. Remember that? How do we do it? And that means that there's too much going on, too much information. We can't count it all, maybe more than we know about. So we become a student in those cases. We become a student and we decide that I'm going to ask questions and try to learn more here. This isn't a case where I can build an argument yet. We also learned about cosmic confusion. Cosmic confusion means that people can kind of spin any yarn they want. They can share any claim about any kind of fantasy they want. And you can just say, oh, well, how about that? That's something. Remember the phrase, how about that? You can use that in a million different situations. I use that when I kind of made it up. I'm not the first in the world, but I use it a lot. The next one I use is, well, that's something. And that's a way to acknowledge that something got said, but you're not committed to any course of action. We learned about the professor's ploy. Remember the rule? Never take on the person with a microphone because they have a superior position. So we don't do that. Now, we don't retreat or disengage, but instead, what do we do? We go to our questions. And in a case like that, we might ask the professor or whoever is playing that role, more questions about what they believe and why they think the things they believe and why they think the way they do. Remember our modest goal? Who knows the modest goal? Raise your hand. I do. We put a stone in someone's shoe. That's the goal. And what does that mean? That when we're done with the conversation and they walk away, they're thinking. It's kind of bothering them. There's something that they're chewing on. We're trying to help people begin to think differently. So we got into the driver's seat in the first class with the Columbo tactic. Lieutenant Columbo, the bumbling detective, but he really is brilliant underneath. And then in class two, we worked on refining the Columbo, refining those tactics. And today, and then using Columbo to lead the way, by the way, to lead the way. Today, we're going to talk about how we go on the offensive in an inoffensive way. So what does that mean? It means in the first two classes, 
it was sort of a passive exploration of where someone else is. In this third class, we're working more on what we want to say, our point of view, and how to sort of contradict or unpack or um, address flaws in someone else's thinking and take them to a new place of understanding. So we're going to use questions now to make a point using Columbo to lead the way. And our questions, think of it this way, our questions are going to serve as arrows going for a target. So we'll use the questions to exploit a weakness or a flaw. We'll use the questions to advance our own point of view. Those are the things that we're going to do now. And we're going to learn how to defend against the Colombo tactic if someone else uses it against us. There's people out there who know how to do this. Maybe they learned it somewhere else. Maybe it's their natural way of asking questions or conversing. We don't know, but you may run into a situation where somebody uses it against you and you're going, hey, wait a minute. This is what I'm doing. So you need to know how you're going to get to your target. What's the target? How are you going to get there? So you're going to need to know some answers. It's a good time to start exploring your learning and, and your, your um, uh, seeking out uh, great writing, watching uh, great videos, uh, listening to great speakers, reading good books to kind of soak it up because you need to know the point you want to make. So here's something we're going to do uh, as a tactic within this Columbo number three, this inoffensive offensive. We're going to learn how to use the other person to help you make the point. So let's look at how that works. First, we determine steps that we need to take to make our point or arrive at our conclusion. What are the steps we need to take? And second, we have to ask questions to get your friend who, or whomever it is you're speaking with to put as many of those steps or parts on the table so you can use them. When you do that, it makes it much harder for them in the future to deny something that they've already agreed to. And in a little while, I'll give you some examples of that. Then we use those parts or pieces to make our point. So we use questions to get pieces or parts of their thinking on the table that help us lead to our conclusion. That way we can get the person to affirm those pieces one by one as I then put my thinking about their pieces on the table. So what might an example be of doing that? Asking questions to get them to put their pieces on the table. Say I ask someone if they believe there's a power greater than themselves uh, that watches over human beings, and they say yes. And I say, so would you call that God? And they say yes. I say, okay. Then what do you think it means when you say God? And they might say, well, I think it's a universal being that is all love and that it cares about all of us. And they go on. So I see that as parts. I put, they say there's a God. They say it's universal. They say it, he, whatever it is, loves all of us. I put those three pieces on the table because I'm going to go back to those and unpack another way to look at them as we go along. And when I do that, if I say, so God is this, they can't say, well, I'm not sure about God because I can say, well, you, you said you believed in God and that he watches over people. So if God watches over us, you see, if they say, well, I'm not sure about that, you can say, well, that's what you said. So you're working with what they said and they can't deny it. It's a, it's a, it's a paradoxical kind of a technique. So we get them to affirm our pieces. So I might say, so you said that there's a God, right? Yes. And you said that God is sort of universal over everyone, right? Yes. So I have confirmation of those two pieces. Great. I have building blocks to work with. So when we look at finding weaknesses and flaws or a contradiction in someone's point of view, there's some points we need to, to walk through here together. Number one, this is important. There's no exact or specific formula for this, but what's key is listening. 
you'll uncover the way you're going to do it by listening carefully and then thinking about what was said. You see how it requires us to be self-moderated and level and engaged and thinking clearly. It's a key part of this process because you might remember we taught you in a previous class that if you get angry or upset or they're angry or upset, both lose because the next step after that is defensiveness. And then the work you want to do doesn't happen. So no specific formula. You uncover uh, what the contradiction, weaknesses, and flaws are and what someone shares by listening carefully, then thinking about what was said. And your own study on the issue is important. So use, I mentioned before, using books, websites, something you've heard, heard on a Sunday in the pastor's sermon, learned in a Bible study, uh, other speakers, other resources. You, you, you gather it all. You sort of more and more uh, immerse yourself in it so it becomes part of you. So here's an example. If someone says to me or asks me, does God exist really? Prove it. I would respond by telling him, well, with the way you put it, prove it. I got to sort some things out first. I need to know what you would count as proof. See how simple that is? They say, oh, you say there's a God, prove it. Well, before I do anything, I need to know what would you count, what kind of evidence would you count as proof that God exists? What's proof to you? Because I know it's about their wiring, it's about who they are, all of those things. So I'm listening and figuring out what, where they're coming from. What if somebody says, you're intolerant? I would, instead of saying, no, I'm not, I'm tolerant, I would just say, what do you mean when you say that? I'm curious. What are you saying? What do you mean? Again, always draw them out. Put their pieces on the table. Here's a rule you need to be watchful for. Here's just a behavior that you need to be careful if it starts. Um, note it. It's, it's, um, it's a shift in the conversation. That's whenever anyone shifts from attacking the point to attacking the person. If they do that, you can exploit that error. Say someone attacks Billy Graham, someone attacks Mother Teresa, or someone else who has great respect or is known in the field, they attack them as a person and not their um, points, you can exploit that. Another thing that's really important in learning to exploit someone's flaws and errors and contradictions is to practice, remember, anticipate, reflect, and practice, practice, practice. If you want to learn the tuba, because many do, <laughs> you'd have to practice two hours a day indefinitely, maybe more. And eventually, guess what? You'd be playing the tuba without reading music. It's similar to this. So I mentioned earlier what happens if somebody uses Columbo against you. Well, let me tell you how that could go. If someone uses Columbo against you, how do you keep from being taken advantage of? How do you keep from being uh, on the defense of backpedaling? How do you do that? Well, I did this very thing the other day in a very intense conversation with someone. I was doing some counseling, and they began to do the Columbo on me. So I realized, I went, oh my gosh, they're doing that. They were saying, so... Do you believe this and this and this, Dennis? And if you do, wouldn't you say that this and this and this, Dennis? Because with those two things, wouldn't you support? And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh. I had pointed out something they were doing that wasn't helpful in a relationship, and they began this. So here's what I said. Or here's the principle first, and I'll tell you what I said. The principle you're thinking is, do they really want to know the answers, or do they have some other goal in mind? You see, because you need to stop the advance. If this is happening, you have to regain control. So here's what I did say to this person. I said, you know, I'm guessing by your questions that you already have an opinion or a point. How about if we just stop the questions and, and I'd love to hear what your point is? They looked at me and realized I was on to it. They said, all right, I really think you think this. Good. We saved us each four to five minutes of, of 
useless banter. Another way to do it is to say, why don't you state your point and give me your reasons and let me chew on it for a while and see what I think. The worst is to go on the defensive. So recognize when someone's using the Columbo on you. So I have some useful statements that help when you challenge flaws in a person's viewpoints. And these are kukul's suggestions. You'll find them in your book. If someone says, well, you can't, you can't uh, establish morality, you can say, well, why not? Very simple, why can't I? Or you can't make that all about morality, why can't I? Why not? It's a simple question. Here's one. Can you tell me something? Do you believe your views are correct? Do you believe your views are right? Now, what if they, they may say something like, well, I believe everybody's view is correct. But even if they say that or they say yes or no, any one of those three answers gives you more to work with as you go deeper into the conversation. For example, if they said, well, I believe everybody's view is correct. You file that away. They said it. You will use that piece at some point as you make your case. You'll come back to and say, but I thought you said that everybody's view is correct. But now you're saying that mine isn't. You see? So here's one. Again, we're looking at statements to use when you're challenge, challenging flaws, errors, or contradictions. Here's one. Help me out here. Why is it that when I think I'm right, you call me intolerant, but when you think you're right, you're just right? What am I missing? What am I missing? You see that? You're exposing the paradox or the double bind or the hypocrisy of it. So... You can do that with a number of topics, not just about being right. Here's another one. What do you mean by just? Because sometimes folks will say, well, that's just your view. The tendency may be if we're still in a defensive mode or, we're, or we lapse into one because we're new at this, we might say, well, it's not just my interpretation. Many smart people interpret the Bible that way. But we're not there yet. Let's try this. Try this. They say, that's just your interpretation. Why not say, what do you mean by the word just? Tell me, tell me what you're thinking. You see, every step of the way, you don't take the bait. You don't backpedal, you don't disengage, and you don't get defensive, and you don't get angry. You just ask another question. No matter what is said, that's why they're called tactics. What do you mean by just? How about this one? Say the person has said, well, my interpretation is valid. Your interpret or everybody's interpretations are valid of the Bible or Deepak Chopra or Khalil Gibran or Eckhart Tolle or religions. Everybody's interpretations are valid because that's a common view with people who aren't Christian or non-committal to a faith. Everybody's interpretations are equally valid. That's a piece or a part they put on the table. You can then say, well, here's my interpretation of what you're saying. And remember, you said all interpretations are equally valid, right? Or could it be, or, or are you saying that really some interpretations are better than others? Tell me. Help me understand. You see the bind, the pickle. It puts people in when you use it that way. What if someone says, well, what if when you say, Jesus says in John, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. None come to the Father but through me. Me. Someone says, well, that's just your interpretation of the Bible. Instead of saying, no, it's not just mine. It's what Dr. Timothy Keller thinks, Pastor Kevin thinks, and a host of people think. Don't waste your time. Try this instead. So tell me what you're thinking. What makes you think I got the meaning of this Bible passage wrong. You could even follow it with, are you thinking that all Bible passages are incorrect or don't mean what they seem to say? What, what's your view of this? And is this just one that you think I got wrong or do you think many more? Do you believe all biblical sayings 
and history and statements are incorrect. See, you're exposing the flaw in their thinking, the flaw in their logic, the error in their presentation, but you're doing it in a calm, respectful way. Here's one that's so common. I wish it wasn't, but it is. When people say, Jesus, he's great. I mean, Jesus is great. You know, Moses, Muhammad, you know, Lao Tzu. Um, there's a lot of great, great teachers throughout history. Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, just great teachers. Jesus was a great teacher also. Or an Islamic position. Jesus was a prophet, but he didn't die on the cross. Therefore, he wasn't buried dead. Therefore, he is not resurrected. He's not the risen Savior. That's uh, the point of view of Islam. So any of those contentions, people make an assertion or a claim, you can ask this question to expose the flaw in that thinking. Well, how you said Jesus was a good man and a prophet. If he is, how could he be mistaken about his own identity and purpose? Because he says right in Scripture who he is and why he came and what his mission is, right? They say, well, that's your interpretation. Then you go right, right back up here, right? So do you think your views are right? And it is my interpretation, but you said earlier all interpretations are valid, right? So is mine valid? Or are you saying mine is not? You see where we're going here. And here's a classic one. This is absolutely classic. How could there be a God with all the evil in the world? What kind of a God would allow the suffering and the evil that happens? And often it's personal. There's general, but often it's personal. Meaning what? Uh, there was a flood that wiped out my aunt's home and it, it uh, killed my cousin. How could, they were very nice people. How could a, a loving God allow that? So they say, so I would ask them, so would you say that's unloving, uncaring? Well, yeah. If you say there's a God, how could he allow? Would you say it's evil and bad or, or all of that? Well, yeah, I would. Where did you come up with that measuring stick? How did, how did you decide that was evil if, you, if there is no God, so there's no, no ultimate reality, there's no morality in Scripture to base what is good and bad off of, which you're claiming, how could you even call it evil? What makes it evil? What makes someone's behavior wrong and evil if they hold someone up on the street and take their wallet and, or a woman in her purse or robbery? What makes it bad? That person wanted to do it. They thought it was okay. Who are we to say it's wrong? See, how do we know anything's evil if we say there's no God? It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And here's something else we can do. When someone asks us a question that really hits home, maybe it's a political question. Maybe it's a question about abortion. Maybe it's a question about gender fluidity. Maybe it's a question about LBGTQ. Maybe it's a question about any other controversial topic of the day. Racism. Anything that we're wrestling with as a culture. Try what Kugel does. He asks a preface question first to set the stage for his remarks. So here's the way it would look. I might say something like this. You know, this is actually a very personal question you're asking, and I don't mind answering it all, but before I do, I want to know it's safe to offer my views. So let me ask you a question. Do you consider yourself a tolerant person or an intolerant person on these kinds of issues? Is it safe to give my opinion, or are you going to judge me for my point of view? Do you respect diverse points of view? Or do you condemn others for convictions that differ from your own? Wow. You know, I often ask couples to do this. When their communications become pressurized, because they're each hurt and wounded, and they're so sensitive and fragile, and then often numb and in full retreat behind walls. And one says, 
Can we talk? Sometimes the other learns to say, before we talk, if it's intense and if it's hard for me to hear, will you please let me know that I'll have time to respond in kind? You know, the same amount of time? Let me know that first because if you say no, I don't know that I can hear it. See, you set the rules of engagement ahead of time. ROE. You can ask questions that set up the rules of engagement. And it just stops people in their tracks. You can have people on the street. They're, they're promoting a petition. Will you sign here to prevent this or foster that or make this happen or support this bill or something? What if you said, I'd like to talk about it first. And before I do, can you assure me that you will give me equal time to share my point of view? And do you consider yourself tolerant or intolerant? In these kinds of uh, discussions, I need to know that because I don't want to be condemned for my point of view. So can you answer those questions first? You're going to stop the whole thing and put it on track. That's rules of engagement. It's a smart way to do it. So if I pose the question, just like I stated, and it's answered in a way that gives me the green light, it's going to be difficult if they try to judge or condemn my answer. I've set the stage. I can say, I see what's happening here. You assured me you were tolerant. You wouldn't judge or condemn and You're doing exactly that. So um, now there's a thing we call moving on to what we call soft or softer approaches, some ways to say things. And this is vintage Columbo. But I use this stuff all the time. I've been using some of it for years, just accidentally. You know, I got I got to tell you the truth. Thirty years ago, when I was counseling with couples up in the Bay Area office, I had a private office. I would say, you know, you kind of got to do a Columbo. Now I'm not tra trying to take anything away from Kukul, but I did because I just loved the way he boxed people in in a gentle, caring way. So here's some soft approaches. I'm going to give you some examples. Imagine Columbo saying this: uh, "Can you clear this up for me?" or uh, can, can you help me understand this? Or I'm curious, fill in the blanks. And here's, why, here's one as he's leaving the room and he goes, you know, something about this thing bothers me. Maybe I'm missing something. I'm a little confused about something. Then a little more kuko mix with Columbo, you might say, let me suggest an alternative alternative and tell me if it's not an improvement. Or, you know, I wouldn't characterize it that way. I, I wouldn't. Here's what I think might be a better or more accurate way to look at it. Or I'm not sure I agree with the way you put it. Would you be willing to think about this and then give them something else to think about in a different direction? Now, I have some more suggestions. These are just mine off some training that I do. You know, that doesn't make sense to me. Here's what would make more sense to me. And these are very simple, but important. Next, I, I see it differently. My view is, and a very simple, I don't agree with you on that. Um, I it looks like we're going to need to agree to disagree or something like it didn't strike me that way. Here's the way it strikes me. Or, you know, I, I don't recall it like that. If people cite something that happened, I'll say, you know, I don't recall it the way you cited it. I recall it differently. All of that lets you state your case without going into defense mode, counterattacking, or anything like that. So let's wrap up this particular class. We've learned in what we call the phase of Columbo 3, or the third Columbo. We move from passive, starting with only the questions to learn and draw someone out. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? And we've moved to a more uh, offensive position, but doing it in an inoffensive way that allows us to stay engaged in the conversation. We reviewed some of the things we learned in the class before around what to do when we're stumped what to do when the professor's ploy is happening, 
what to do with the cosmic confusion. How do counter somebody's using the Columbo on us? So we've talked about also exposing weaknesses and flaws in the other person's position by using certain types of questions and statements. Remember, we ask questions and statements and have them say what they think, put those pieces on the table or parts, and then we verify with them, so you said this, right? And you said that, right? And we do that so when we begin later to challenge any of those, they can't deny they said it. And that's before we say anything about what we believe. So then we advance our point of view, and that's using that other person to help make our point of view by getting their pieces on the table. Then we looked at samples of soft approaches in digging deeper in a conversation. And so I want to encourage you again, as, as we walk through these tactics and techniques, it's really important if you intend to use them, and I sure hope you do. They're, gosh, they're so helpful. I'm already using lots of them. I am. And, and I really enjoy it. Part of it is I'm, I'm uh, studying to teach, studying to do these videos. I'll meet with you in your small groups to walk through questions after the videos. But it's really helping me. I want to encourage you to add to your knowledge base. Get in God's Word and read and study. Join a Bible study. And these days, you could join a Bible study online anywhere in the world. But please feel welcome to join the Shoreline Bible Studies. They're online, men and women's. Uh, they're easy to get into. Um, join online, and we can chat, and you, you can uh, just learn and grow, and documents are shared, and all of that. Also, find apologists. I mentioned in the first class, there's things that are easy to watch, bite-sized pieces on YouTube. The One Minute Apologist. Remember, apologist or apologistics or apologetics is the defense of and the promotion of a certain point of view. That's what it is. So look online, look at YouTube, look at the books you already have, ask around who's reading what, um, listen to great teaching. We love that you're attending Shoreline Online and many of you coming to our outdoor services. But, you know, in between, there's other great teaching at, at other churches. Start building your library. For, for as you get better with this, you're going to be more and more able to answer with information that you believe in when you're exposing flaws, errors, and contradictions. And then we looked at soft approaches, and that's a lot of fun to do also. So design yours. Remember, there's no specific way to do this, but what I've tried to do is give you some ideas of how to do it. And after you watch this video, we have a list of questions and topics to discuss and uh, kind of uh, sharpen each other on an answer to help us all get better and better at doing this. And lastly, the whole design around Kukul's tactics, tried and tested, are that anyone can do this. You don't have to be a, a, a PhD Bible scholar to, to use these tactics to promote the faith. One last tip, if you haven't seen the Greg Kukul slash Deepak Chopra debate on YouTube at a show hosted by Lee Strobel, you've got to see it. As I shared before, that's what hooked me. So thank you for joining us. Um, I look forward to the very next class, and I look forward to uh, talking with you, uh, interacting with you on the small group discussions following uh, this training video. Until then, God bless. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, please visit our Wednesday night at Shoreline online page on our website and click Join Discussion for the Tactics class. We will dig deeper into the truths we've just heard and spend some time in fellowship and prayer. See you there.